June 2011, this is Fair Observer, a new multimedia journal that enables you to make sense of the world. I am Abdul Singh, founder and editor-in-chief, and with me is Justin Dargan, a research fellow at the Dubai Institute at Harvard Kennedy School. Today we'll be talking about global energy and the Middle East, and without further ado, I'm going to pose to Justin my first question. So Justin, what role, in your estimate, did rising energy prices play in triggering the Arab Spring? Well, I think, uh, Atul, that rising energy prices actually had uh, several different uh, roles, so it's a bit multifaceted. Um, now, on one hand, it's not necessary that uh, it was the rising price of oil or natural gas that precipitated much of the political discontent. However, what uh, we've discovered is that when you look at the rise in the price of basic foodstuffs, uh, and this was this has actually been, been an ongoing affair from about uh, 2001, and then to its uh, more or less peak in 2008, and then we see a slight decline, then an increase again in 2009, 2010, 2011. Now, why did this happen? Well, a major part of this increase in, um, uh, in the price of basic foodstuffs had to do with uh, biofuel production uh, policies of Western countries and also large emerging markets such as uh, China and India as well. So there have just been enormous amounts of uh, basic foodstuffs that have been turned into fuel, more or less, uh, for two reasons, two major reasons. Uh, on one hand, there was uh, the goal to mitigate uh, carbon emissions uh, on uh, the part of many of the Western countries, so that's why they want to increase biofuel production. And then on the, um, on the side of uh, some of the major emerging markets, such as China, we see this drive for energy security. So, for instance, China does not want to be tied into or necessarily dependent on imports uh, emanating from uh, the Middle East or from other regions because of views that um, if there's any type of disruption, then it could, it's, it, it's more or less a national security issue. So China wants to increase its biofuel fuel production, and by this way, it could seek to diversify its energy production yeah. and also its imports. So for the past uh, decade, we've seen uh, increases or, or increasing pressure on a price of uh, basic foodstuffs in most of the developing world uh, due to these uh, energy policies. So the part that this played, or the role that this played in terms of the Arab Spring, if we look at Tunisia, where um, the Arab Spring started, uh, we can see basically in the months leading up to uh, the, uh, the protests and the riots and so on and so forth, uh, there was about a 20 to 30 percent increase in the price of um, of basic foodstuffs, okay, if we look at the um, uh, index that's been used by uh, the United Nations of Food and Agricultural Organization, and that actually in the year of uh, the year of 2010, that this was actually the largest increase across the board in terms of uh, the 20 or so uh, foodstuffs that it tracks, uh, that, it's, that it's actually ever seen. So, I mean, I think that this is quite significant. So, yes, there are underlying political uh, grievances, okay, in the Middle East, mm -hmm. yes, of course. But I don't necessarily think that this was the only issue, no. Because if we look at other countries that don't necessarily have political systems that meet, uh, let's say, uh, the requirements of Western democracy, but yet at the same time, uh, they have an uh, economic system which um, has more or less uh, been able to move many of the people out of poverty. So if we look at uh, Singapore... We look at Korea for uh, much of its uh, history after the so, Korean War. So fundamentally, what, fundamentally what you're saying is that as long as uh, society, as long as uh, a country has a political system that is delivering on the economic front and is meeting the, its basic governance obligations, you'll be fine. But if there is an underlying malfunction and there is huge grievance, then the price of bread like uh, it always has historically, it might lead to revolution. And that uh, the rise in uh, price in bread, or let's say food, bread being metaphoric for food, was fundamentally because of rising energy prices. So the unrest in the Middle East, the Arab Spring, holds itself in great deal to the rising energy prices. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, I would say. So now, I mean, of course, in other countries where um, you don't uh, necessarily have uh, a liberal system, I don't yes. think that um, 
I don't think that merely delivering economic goods will satisfy the people once they reach a certain yeah. level. So when the majority of the then people are at a, yeah. at a middle class level or what have you, then I think that they would want to have an increase in say in governance. So I think that there is a type of double movement, whereas while the, pe while the country is developing, I think that the people will mute their political demands. But then once they reach a certain level, then they will want to have other things. Okay, and then they, they want to have... Right, exactly. Yeah, the ratchet up. Exactly. So, so let, let's move on to the second question and uh, swing the conversation in the direction of, uh, of energy. And my question here is, the Arab Spring is a glorious, wonderful thing, but uh, what effect has it had on energy prices? It, of course, was affected by energy prices. What in turn has its effect been on energy prices? Well, it had uh, an immediate effect, actually. Um, when we look at Tunisia, uh, after protests started in Tunisia, we, we start to see a type of uh, incremental increase uh, in, uh, in the international price of oil. Now, uh, the increase was not necessarily that significant or that large, but it was perceptible. Okay, so this was mm -hmm. evident. And uh, when Egypt started to happen, then actually there was a larger increase in uh, the international price of of, of oil. So the question that we really must ask is why is this? Because Tunisia is not an, uh, an energy producing country, it's an energy importing country. Uh, Egypt right. does produce minimal amounts of oil and uh, natural gas, but it really has no significant impact in terms of uh, the international oil or, or, or natural gas uh, uh, market. Uh, so we have to ask this question and fundamentally, initially it was due to speculation. Okay, so it was due to the uh, the impact uh, that investors and, 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 and speculators and, uh, and also the, future mar the futures market has on the international uh, oil sector that really caused this increase in the price of uh, the international price of oil. And that was one major factor. And why were speculators and investors concerned? Well, they were concerned simply because not necessarily due to the proximate impact of the Arab, of let's say the Egyptian revolution or so on and so forth, even though that was that was there. People, some people thought that um, there might be an outburst and let's say incidences of terrorism against oil infrastructure or that the Suez Canal might be blocked. And all this later on, of course, proved to be, uh, you know, proved not to happen. Um, but the primary fear was that this would spread. So it would, it would be like a contagion. That's what contagion. many people thought. Exactly. Right. So that this would yeah. spread immediately to the major, I mean, to the elephant in the room. And, and what is the elephant in the room? It's Saudi Arabia, of course, and also right. it's, it's, it's some of the other major oil producing countries. Yeah. So that was the major fear. So it wasn't necessarily yeah. due to Egypt and Tunisia by themselves. It was due to the potential impact that this Arab Spring could have on yeah. uh, the, principally Saudi Arabia. So, um, yes. so, so we start to and, see... And that, and, that, mm -hmm. and that brings me on to, to the next question, that the Arab Spring is, is, uh, is like a genie which is now out of the bottle. It's only the beginning of continued unrest in the Middle East. Yes. Because this is a process that will continue. People will have greater demands. Those in establishment will try to regain power. There is going to be internal friction in almost every country, including Saudi Arabia. And so the, for, so the question now is, what are the prospects for the Middle East to continue to be a reliable energy supplier in the light of the fact that the genie is now out, out of the bottle? Okay. I, will, that, I mean, that's a very good point. Although we have to remember is that outside of Libya, and Libya really is not a ma it doesn't really have a major impact on the international uh, uh, oil sector. I mean, Libya only uh, only exports uh, about two percent, you could say, uh, of um, yeah. of the of the international oil supply. So I mean, yeah. it's not really that big of a player. Uh, but when yeah. you look at Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and so on, obviously these are uh, major players. But as of yet, the Arab Spring has not had a structural impact on the energy mm -hmm. sector. It, it has not. So it has not upset the basic dynamics of, uh, of, of, of the market forces of uh, supply and demand. So there hasn't been any type of pressure yeah. on production anywhere in the yeah. Middle East, outside of Libya, of course, and perhaps yeah. minimally uh, in yeah. Egypt. And I don't necessarily think that uh, Saudi Arabia, so the dynamics of each Arab country are different. 
Okay, they, they're, they're not the same, obviously. I mean, so in Tunisia, you have rates of secularization that you don't have in Egypt. In Egypt, you have rates of poverty that you don't have in Saudi Arabia. And also, you have a sectarian element in Saudi Arabia that you don't have in other countries. So, I mean, I mean, so the, the issues are quite different. So, I, I do question as to whether this Arab Spring is necessarily going to impact in a big way the major oil producers. And I don't necessarily think that will be the case when you look at the major Gulf oil producers. I, I, I don't think that would be the case. I think that, yes, there will be some type of dissent, there will be some type of discord, but I think that the basic elements of production, the structural mm -hmm. issues, are not really going to be touched. Okay, so, so that brings me on uh, to the next question. You said production is not going to be touched, the basic structural elements are not going to be changed. So what does it mean? For, uh, for prices and energy security, is it all going to be hunky-dory and uh, uh, this uh, play of prices and speculation is here? Or uh, do you think that um, the, uh, the uh, continued instability is going to ratchet up uh, oil prices because of the psychological effect or something? Well, I mean, I, I, I do think that, uh, I mean, it's not going to be hunky-dory, okay, definitely not, okay, because uh, there was this one speaker I recall from several weeks ago that I heard. He did not refer to it as the Arab Spring. He referred to it as the Arab Firestorm. Okay. And this really, this really is. It's a firestorm, really. And the thing is, it's not. I mean, the, one of the things that we tend to forget is that this is not focused on the Middle East. There are about 20 or 30 countries now that are undergoing extreme political discontent at the moment that, are, that, that really uh, are uh, that this political discontent is derived from. Uh, the demonstration effect that we saw in the Middle East. So uh, one thing that really hasn't been discussed is what's going on in Africa. I mean, there's, there are many countries in Africa that are going now through some type of political discontent and simply because they saw what was going on in the Middle East. I mean, and even if we look at Europe, okay, if we look at um, Greece, if we look at Spain, uh, there's a movement. Uh, sincerely, it's called the, the, the movement, uh, I think, the May 15th movement or something along those lines. In May 15th. This, this, this part, even in India, there's a huge cry over corruption. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The communists, communists have been thrown out in messing all after three, four years of uninterrupted power. So there's a lot going on globally. There's a lot. I mean, globally, globally. I mean, so I mean, this is an important issue. I mean, I mean, frankly. Um, but I mean, I don't think that. I mean, if you look at uh, the basic elements of supply and demand. Okay, look at it now. Since uh, you know, since Arab Spring, let's say, started in January, go back about a year ago. Okay, not much has changed. Okay, there really has so, not. So, so, so let me get back to the question again. Okay. So, what do you think, precisely, in precise terms, about the basic impact on global energy prices and security, global energy? Security? Okay. Well, one in terms of the international energy. Well, I, I want to say international oil prices because more or less it's not really going to have an impact on uh, on on, uh, on the prices of natural gas. So, in terms of oil prices, uh, I think that yes, it's going to have a significant impact, and I think a lot of this is driven by uh, the fear premium. Okay, so if we look at or speculation and the futures market and so on, so the oil market today is more or less like the stock market. Okay, and, and why do I say that? Is that uh, if you want to see how IBM, I mean, a lot of the stock prices are not due to how the company's actually doing. It's due to investors' perceptions of how the country or how the company is going to do. And that's more or less how the, how the oil market is today. It's like the stock market, okay? So it's really driven by uh, by buyers and uh, perceptions of how the market's going to be, any type of future constraints and so on and so forth. But I think that due to this aspect, yes, there's going to be an, an impact, and I think that for the next several years, that we're going to see an increase in the price, uh, international price of oil, due to the Arab Spring and due to uh, the perception that the, that the region is, is not stable and that it may roll over into other areas. But at the same time, I think it's important to remember, too, is that there has been uh, structural forces at play that has really uh, been, uh, that has really driven up the international price of oil incrementally. Okay, so if you look at... I mean, you allude presumably to the increasing demand of emerging markets. Exactly. Exactly. And when the global economy picks back up, as uh, many people think it, it may in the next few years, uh, then this will also be another structural impact. So I think that 
there's going to be a confluence of these two tribes. There's going to be obviously the, the speculative effect, which is uh, you know the effect that's going to have on the international price of oil, and then there's also going to be the more long-term and incremental structural in, uh, uh, the, the structural rise in the price. Of, uh, of, of oil, the international price of oil. So prices, prices will go up. Yes, uh, prices are going up. Yeah, and, and, and what about uh, security? Security is not a concern, do you think? Well, I mean, uh, energy security, not really. I mean, the only way that I would see energy security playing a role is that energy security is not really related to high prices. That's a different issue, no, it is, it is, I would say. It is, it is related to construction and supply. It's related to it's something like something that's happening in Libya, happening perhaps in Saudi Arabia. That was sort of the world in the city. That's, that's correct. That's correct. And also, uh, many different, different countries, countries are, are, are different countries view energy security different ways. So the United States views energy security as, let's say, removing its dependence on, let's say, uh, outside sources of energy, such as the Middle East or Latin America, and increasing indigenous. Uh, uh, production. Right. Europe, yeah. the European yeah. Union, views energy security as what? As removing itself uh, from uh, dependence on uh, on imports from Russia and principally natural yeah. gas, and diversifying its uh, diversifying its imports from other regions, principally the Middle East, which is in contradistinction to what the U.S. is actually trying to do. So energy security actually is different. Uh, it means different things to different uh, stakeholders. But to get back to your question. Uh, what role I think it's going to have in terms of energy security. I don't think it will have much of a role in terms of the basic nuts and bolts of energy security, in terms of disrupting uh, exports. I don't think so. The only way that that would happen is if there's some type of, uh, let's say, radical uh, government uh, that comes to power uh, in one of the major oil producing countries. A type of. I, 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 Most of the world in Egypt has declared war on Israel. Yes, yeah, so, something along. Yes, yeah, yeah, something along those lines. lines yes, yeah. or, or, or or let's say they, they decide that they decide that okay, we're not going to export to the West anymore. Uh, what we're going we're going to embargo the West. Right, it's it's to China. China. Although that would have repercussions on them as well because it's a marriage more or less. I mean, it's a mutual it's a mutual dependency. Uh, so I I don't really see that happening. I just see prices increasing over over. I mean, I've seen the short term, mid term, and long term. But I don't see there being any type of uh, uh, substantive disruption. Okay, uh, this brings me on uh, the next question, which is, are there any viable alternatives? Uh, you talked about increasing demand in the global demand. Uh, are there any viable alternatives to oil, especially given what is happening in Fukushima? Uh, I think that uh, in terms of Okay, when we look at uh, the role of oil in the international economy, the role of oil is really predicated on the transportation sector. Okay, so this is quite important. There are minimal amounts of oil used in power generation, but more, for the most part, power generation all over the world is, uh, is, uh, is, is uh, dependent upon natural gas. And then also there's nuclear energy. Or coal, coal in China, yes, but there's really not that much oil. Okay, so we have to look at the transportation sector. In terms of the transportation sector, I don't really see any viable alternatives at the moment, although I do see it coming. Um, as we've seen in the U.S., there are now increasing um, ads for uh, electric cars, hybrid cars, and what have you. But it would take, a, I would say, about a generation for there to be any type of uh, substantive transition. Away from uh, cars that are, you know, obviously cars are using um, uh, gasoline uh, to, let's say, electric cars, and also with the economic slump currently, it's it's going to extend this time period. So obviously, many people are not going to go for that electric car. Right, right, right. Exactly. At least for, I would say, for this generation. Uh, so I think in terms of natural gas, though, uh, there has been, let's say, a type of shift towards natural gas, uh, at least conceptually, in the wake of Fukushima. So I don't think Fukushima is really going to have a role in terms of the oil economy, but in terms of, let's say, the transition that at least was in the making, the nuclear renaissance, as they called it, uh, since 2000, yes, it, it, it's definitely going to have an impact. It's going to have an impact on the popular level. 
in terms of the NIMBY concept, not in my backyard. We already see this happening in the U.S. We see it happening in Europe and so on. There's been a comp comprehensive reassessment on the role of nuclear energy in many countries that were really basing all of their, most of their climate mitigation or their carbon mitigation goals on increasing nuclear energy production. Now there's a re reassessment. But I really don't... Look, look, the green power in modern Gothenburg, the conservative yes. state, the conservative place in Germany, and yes. green came, in, came into power thanks to Fukushima. So clearly, uh, you know, there will be huge, huge, huge public uproar now whenever someone wants to build the nuclear power station in their backyard. There, there, there is. There is. But I, I, I don't... So, 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 so here's my question. Now, given that, what does this do to climate change, global climate change strategy? If you know, the nuclear renaissance is over, so what next? Well, I, 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 I wouldn't be as bold as of yet to say the nuclear renaissance is over. I think it's still it's still in the making. Okay, this is a very fluid situation, as, as some people like to say, there are a lot of different moving parts. Okay, but definitely it's put on hold, I would say. Okay, so I, I think that's a major issue. And and my, how can I say, my perception of what's going to happen, my forecast is that there are just going to be uh, increasing safeguards that are going to be placed on nuclear energy. There's going to be some type of pullback, but it's not going to be the same type of reaction that we saw in the wake of, uh, of uh, Three Mile Island in Chernobyl, uh, where there was a full, full scale pullback uh, or, or retrenchment, let's say, of nuclear energy. So, I mean, in terms of um, our climate change goals, yes, I mean, I think that this is a fundamental contradiction. Okay, and I, there, there are many different contradictions in place, but I mean, the fundamental one is that, okay, we as a world, we want to move away from, uh, we want to move away from, uh, let's say, hydrocarbons as a fuel source, uh, but as of yet, there's really nothing that can take that place at the moment except for nuclear energy on, uh, let's say, a, a broad scale, okay, truly. And then on the other hand, we still talk about economic growth. Okay, okay, so, so economic, economic growth is the mantra that we hear from most politicians, uh, particularly in the wake of the global economic crisis. crisis. But what does economic growth mean? It means increasing consumption, and it also means increasing energy use. So if you really want to tackle energy consumption, and also there's an organic linkage between energy consumption and, uh, and carbon, uh, carbon emissions, you really have to uh, lower your economic growth. Uh, because economic, economic growth is a major issue. issue. And, and, and when, when we, we look, look at, let's say, uh, several instances in history with um, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, Union. when that, that happened in 1991, the, the carbon emissions from the former Soviet, Soviet Union, Union, I think they were nearly halved. halved. It was cut, cut nearly in half. half. Okay, so, so and, and also, uh, you know, you know, I'm advocating uh, uh, a global recession. I, 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 I'm not. But, but we have to be realistic. We really have to be realistic about, okay, if you don't want nuclear energy, and then at the same time you want to have increased, you want to have economic growth, 3 to 4 percent every year, then how, what, how are you going to do this while still meeting your, climate, uh, your, your carbon mitigation goal? I, I would say yes. What do you think? What do you think? Is if you want to take economic growth, you have to have nuclear energy. That is the only way you can lower the uh, climate impact. I, I, I would say so. Yes. Another, another way, though, that you could have uh, a type of impact, of course, is natural gas. And, uh, yeah. and and transitioning, let's say, coal from natural, natural gas, gas yeah. that would have an immediate impact. Okay, okay obviously. Uh, okay. okay, and, and with the show gas, gas revolution in the U.S., okay, okay that, that has yeah, really had a major impact in terms of, of uh, let's say, uh, lowering our carbon, carbon emission. But, but then, then we have, have to look at the next stage, stage okay, because natural gas is still a hydrocarbon, so there's still carbon emissions inherent in that in its use. So then to move from the next stage, yeah, it's yes, it's a lot cleaner than coal. Yes, yes, obviously, obviously. But, but then, then if we want, want to, to sorry, yes, 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 yes absolutely. absolutely, but if we want to move from uh, natural gas, gas to, to, let's say, decarbonizing our economy, because, because you don't decarbonize with natural gas, gas because it's still a hydrocarbon, then, then you, you would have, have to go to nuclear energy. energy. So, so that, that, that I think that's the conundrum. But that again brings the question of weight, and the nuclear energy, we don't know what the long-term impact of that weight might be, how safe can you store weight? Of 
Yes, yes. yes. I mean, I think, I think it's, I think it's akin to whether there's a type of uh, acute condition or chronic condition. Okay, so with, with nuclear energy production, it, uh, there's a risk that there could be some type of acute disaster, such as Fukushima, which is on the news and so on and so forth. Okay, but with uh, climate change, this is a long-term chronic condition. It's a long-term chronic condition. So I would say that we'd have to weigh these elements, whether we're willing to accept and, and I think that actually, from what I understand, most climate scientists really say that it's too late to change, that now it's all about climate uh, adaptation. Really, really that, that, and, that, and, that, and that they're not, say, seriously, that, 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 that we should focus on this. And many cities in the U.S. have been doing this. Uh, uh, Chicago has now really, has now put in place a multi-decade year plan for climate adaptation. Okay, okay, to, to deal, deal with uh, several percentage rise, rise in temperatures. Uh, and, and then uh, many other cities and states are doing that. that. So, so from what I understand is that some climate scientists, scientists they don't want to say to the populace at large that climate change is happening now. now. And, and that, that due, due to the cumulative effect of carbon in the atmosphere, atmosphere that there's really nothing we can do now that would have an immediate impact, impact. that we, we just have to wait it out for the next 50 or 100 years until everything that we're doing now starts, as it, as start that, it starts to have an impact. So I, 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 it might be too late to actually do something about climate change per se, but from what I understand, they don't want to make people afraid and they don't want, they, they, they want to at least give people some type of uh, impression, uh, impression that, that they can, can still, still do something. something. But, but I, 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 I don't think, think that, that, from what I understand. Yeah, there's too many things, so let's call an adaptation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
uh, uh, start to uh, take, take place in the developed world. world. So, so we're going to see a long-term, long -term, um, much, much more incremental increase in the price of, of uh, the international price of oil. For the long term. And, and, yeah, when I say the long term, term action should fall by this, I would say 2020, 2025. Okay, all right. Fair enough. Okay, 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 Okay,